Hello, and welcome again to the Bayside Sermon Series Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Duckworth, Media and Technical Director here at Bayside. This week's sermon discussion, The Shout of Praise, Song 63. This episode, we're going to do things a little different. Instead of discussing the sermon points with the pastor, we're going to spend some time looking at the source material for this psalm. We will still go through the discussion questions, but some of the responses that we will be developing will come from 2 Samuel. David wrote many psalms based on whatever he was experiencing in his life. One example of this is Psalm 51, where David repents after being confronted by Nathan for his actions towards Bathsheba. Let's take some time to understand why David wrote Psalm 63 and how we can learn from what he went through and still raise our voice to God with a shout of praise. Now, our Hebrew word for the week is Shabbach. The word Shabbach is commonly translated praise, but it can also be translated as to commend, to glory, or triumph. The primary root meaning behind the word is to address in a loud tone. So, Shabbach is to express praise, but in a loud tone or loud voice. This is in contrast to that of a reflective, meditative, or quiet attitude of worship. This is loud. This is a shout of praise. It literally means to raise a holy roar. It occurs just one time in Psalm 63, in verse 3. So, let's take a moment and read that. O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. Now, as we go through that psalm, the word praise happens multiple times. One of those times is actually in verse 5, and that is translated from our word from last week, halal. All right, let's move on to the second question from the discussion points. Psalm 63 is labeled as a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Why was he in this wilderness regions? On Sunday, Pastor James said that there are two possible times when David could have written the psalm. One was when he was being chased by King Saul, or when he was being overthrown by his son Absalom. Now, I believe it was the latter instance because in verse 11, David refers to himself as king. And before King Saul died, David was very reluctant to call himself king. So here's the context of what is happening in Psalm 63. We'll be starting in 2 Samuel 15, and we'll read about David's son Absalom, whose name actually means, My father is peace, which is kind of ironic as to all the wars that David fought. Absalom rose up against David, in this chapter of 2 Samuel, and then David fled Jerusalem. David mournfully retreats from the city with several thousand soldiers and part of the royal family. And in chapter 16, we see that he is cursed at 
by a man named Shimei. When one of David's men offers to behead Shimei, David has a very humble response. Verse 11 of 2 Samuel 16. Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. Now we'll see in the closing verses of Psalm 63 that David trusts that God will deal with those who seek to destroy him. As the story continues in chapter 17 of 2 Samuel, they have escaped capture from Absalom's men and crossed over the Jordan River. A group of Ammonites gave those traveling with David food and water, and they said in verse 29, The people are hungry and weary and thirst in the wilderness. Here's a list of what was given to David. Beds, basins, earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, and sheep and cheese. Which David makes reference to most of these things throughout Psalm 63. Thirsting in a dry and weary land, in verse 1. Being satisfied with fat and rich foods, in verse 5. Remembering and meditating on God from his bed. Now, Absalom and his army do go after David and are defeated, but David commands his army to deal gently with Absalom. However, Absalom does die during the battle, and he dies in a somewhat comical fashion. In 2 Samuel 18, there is a C.S. Lewis-like moment where the writer mentions that the forest devours more people than the sword that day. Our imaginations can surely take off when we think of how these men might have been dying. But in verse 9 of 2 Samuel 18, we see that Absalom was riding his mule, and while charging through some branches, got his head stuck in a tree. But the mule kept going. This left Absalom dangling from the tree. Now, David's men were divided about what to do with Absalom, but eventually they did kill him. They threw him in a pit in the forest and covered him under many heavy stones. Which is how Psalm 63 verse 9 describes the fate of those who seek to destroy David. Discussion point 3. In verse 4, David expresses his dependence on God. What physical action does David do to show us that he is dependent on God? And what is God's response to this action? If we're looking in verse 4, David lifts his hands in prayer to God. Now, worshiping or praying with hands raised is not something I grew up with and still struggle with today. I've come to appreciate and understand this practice as a part of personal worship and communion with God. Verse 8 says that God's right hand upholds me. Now, there's a deeper context here because in many cultures throughout history, The right hand shows honor. One way we still see this in our culture today is a simple handshake. Typically, we are brought up to shake with our right hands, unless for some other reason we would have to shake with our our left. In the military, they salute with the right hand. So to add this context to verse 8, not only is God accepting of our praise with raised hands, He welcomes our offerings and honors us with his shalom, his peace and comfort. Discussion point four. Verses five through eight tell us how David's soul is finally satisfied. How is David's soul satisfied? Where does David find help and protection? And what causes David to sing for joy? Now, throughout scripture, Figurative language is used to describe several attributes of God. In verses 5 through 8, David speaks of the comforts and satisfaction that God blesses him with and the protection he feels in the shadow of your wings. Like how a mother hen collects her chicks to protect them. 
If we look at the account in 2 Samuel chapter 19, it's clear to see that even though David wins the battle, he still lost his son, his oldest son. He's not even able to properly mourn his loss because of the intense grieving shows David's army that their lives were worth less than that of Absalom. Starting in verse 4, The king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O my son Absalom, O Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab, one of David's commanders, came into the house and said to the king, You have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants, who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines, because you love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, then you would be pleased. Now, therefore arise, go out, and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stand with you this night, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. So what else can David do but look to God for comfort? In 2 Samuel 22, David is reflecting on his life and the many times God has delivered him. It's an amazing psalm, so I encourage you all to read it, but I'll just read the first three verses. The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge. My Savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. How can we look anywhere else but to God for our strength? David is so confident in God's deliverance, he says, I am saved from my enemies, not I will be saved. If our whole trust is on the Lord, then we can rest knowing that God has already saved us from our enemies. Discussion point five. How does David view his enemies? Who are David's enemies? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, and 4 that our real enemies are not human enemies. So who is our real enemy? Let's read that passage of scripture. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging a war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Let's look back at 2 Samuel. David is fighting a war for his kingdom because of a great sin in the family. In chapter 13, we read about three of David's children, Absalom, Tamar, and Amnon. Amnon was the half-sibling of Absalom and Tamar, but he became infatuated with his half-sister and eventually raped her. David failed to act as king and father, and Absalom killed Amnon, then fled. Eventually, David calls Absalom home, but they never resolved what happened. And after years of waiting for David to reconcile the family, Absalom began to speak lies about his father and gained the trust of the people, which ultimately led to the revolt that we mentioned in chapter 15. Who is our enemy? Sin is the enemy, and the father of lies who deceives us wants nothing more than to destroy our relationship with God. But we should not fear these attacks. Remember David's reaction to Shimei? David is being personally and physically attacked as he's had insults and rocks hurled at him. But instead of reacting, David says, Leave him alone. 
and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. David recognizes that God is in control, and that using self-control brings honor to God. In just that short response, David uses the name of the Lord three times. He's reminding himself and those around him of who is in control. Now, in verse 9 of Psalm 63, David writes about the fate of his enemies. And what I find interesting about this verse is that he says that they will go down into the depths of the earth. Not Sheol. Sheol, or Hades, depending on the translation that you have from your Bible, was the place to which people descended at death, a holding place for the souls of the dead. The language that David is using in verse 9 is only referring to the physical resting place of the dead. He also uses more figurative language in verse 11 of that psalm. For the mouths of liars will be stopped, which alludes to death, the only way to stop a liar from lying. Discussion point six. Throughout Psalm 63, we find David praising God. He praises God in the wilderness while meditating on God's blessings, and he praises God with the knowledge that his enemies will one day be defeated. Is it easy for us to praise God in these same situations? How can we use Psalm 63 as a template for our own praise? Let's look again at 2 Samuel. Chapter 19, David is restored as king of all of Judah. What did he do to all the people who rose up with Absalom to overthrow him? He forgave them. The worst offenders didn't even wait for David to get back to Jerusalem to beg for forgiveness. Shimei ran to the Jordan River with a thousand men to help the king cross the river. The same guy who offered to behead Shimei for cursing David offered to kill him again when he apologized. Not only did David reject the idea, he swore to Shimei an oath that he would not die. And in verse 4 of Psalm 63, we see that the main thing to focus on is to bless the name of the Lord as long as we live. Nothing else matters. If we stay focused on God, then we won't be afraid when he calls us to walk on the water. Now, as we've been doing for the last couple of podcasts, we're asking, where is the gospel presentation in this sermon series? As we come to a close of our time this week, let's take a moment to look at these passages of Scripture through the lens of the gospel presentation. Where do we see the example of Christ in Psalm 63 and 2 Samuel? From the sermon this week, Pastor James said that the big idea was to let the volume of our praise be louder than our pain. I think it's safe to say that everyone at some point has felt like they have let their parents down and that they have been let down by their parents. David is in a no-win situation because someone has to lose this battle. His failure to deal with the egregious sins of his son Amnon led to the eventual death of both Amnon and Absalom. There is a consequence to sin, and that is death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, while the consequence of sin is death, God has the remedy ready to give to anyone who believes. We have a good God and Father who is always reaching for us. When we allow our anger to cause us to sin against our brother, it's the same as murdering him in our heart. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. This is Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Jesus takes the law of Moses, Thou shalt not kill, 
and turns it into a principle that reminds us that our hatred towards another image-bearer of God is just as deadly as physically killing them. So, let the volume of our praise be louder than our pain. In the final moments of the crucifixion, Jesus was in relentless agony and at the same time was being mocked and scoffed at in what I like to refer to as the final temptation of Christ. Luke records in chapter 23 that some of the people that were watching the crucifixion were saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. But the response Jesus gave was to cry out to God. In verse 46, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, I encourage each of you to be courageous enough to call out to the Lord, who is our rock, in our fortress, and our deliverer. He is worthy to be praised, and we are saved from our enemies. Thank you for listening today to the podcast. Next week, we will continue in our Holy War series with Pastor Dave Ritter. Thank you for your time and have a blessed week.